Let's get ready for a take. Mark it. Action. Hello everyone and welcome to another live lounge at the University of Lincoln um, and don't we have a busy session for you this evening. Uh, so these sessions are designed to give you all the information that you'll need before you start in September about university life in general and Lincoln specifically. So today we're joined by several of our colleagues from various wellbeing services across the university and we're going to give you the rundown on all the ways we can support you whilst you're studying here at Lincoln. So I'm just going to go around quickly and get everyone to introduce themselves. So I'll start with myself. My name's Luke. I was a student here at the university and now I work here and I'll just pass on to Catherine. Hello, my name's Catherine and I'm from the university student support and advice team. Perfect. And Tom, do you want to go next? Yeah, so I'm Tom. I am from the Student Wellbeing Centre um, at the University of Lincoln. Lovely stuff. Uh, we'll pass on to Jazz. Hi everyone, um, I'm Jasmine and I'm a student recruitment officer here at Lincoln. And Nixie. Hi guys, I'm Nixie, I'm from the Student Union Advice Centre. And lastly we have Lulu. Hi, my name is Lulu, I'm from the Rest Life team on campus. Lovely, well thanks all for joining us. Um, if you are watching today, please drop all your questions into the comments section below. We'll be answering those later on. So anything you're concerned about, anything you want to know, pop it in that comment section and we'll get to it uh, later on, hopefully. So like I mentioned, we've got a busy session today, so I do want to jump straight into it. So first, if it's OK, uh, we're going to speak to Catherine about the Student Support and Advice Centre within the university. Hello. So, Catherine, how are you doing today? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm absolutely amazing. Thank you for asking. So, Catherine, like I say, busy session, and we're probably starting with one of the biggest and widest reaching support services at the university. So just for starters, could you tell us what the Student Support and Advice Centre actually do? Yeah, that's a really good question. So the Student Support and Advice Centre is um, right in the centre of the university, and it's really somewhere where you can get support and advice about anything really if it isn't to do specifically with your academic program if you're not sure where to go to about something i would suggest you start with the student support and advice center they've got a team of student support officers who can help you with letters that you might need finding out who you need to speak to about other problems but also direct you to specialists as well if you've got issues that happen as you go along your studies that you might need to get a bit of help with so you say issues with your studies and things. So is it just study specific or do you help students outside of their studies as well? Oh, we do a lot of work with students who have issues that might affect their time at study. So you might have problems that you couldn't possibly have expected to have with. You might have worries about your student finance, for example. You might find that things aren't going quite as well as you thought they might do. And there might be a problem. And we have specialist people within that team who can help you get that sorted, as well as other issues like uh, I don't know, maybe um, problems with your accommodation or a part time job that you might have. Or maybe if you're a carer and you've got carer's allowance or other welfare benefits, there are people who can help you during your studies so that doesn't cause you a problem while you're studying. Amazing. And you mentioned there that uh, there's a specialist that can help. I think it's worth noting that actually all of the team are specialists and have been working in their areas for a very long time. Absolutely. We've got specialists in many different areas, you say, people who know all about the university, but also people who might know about, I don't know, if you've got children or families and all of those different areas of life that might um, interfere with your studies and we need to make sure that they don't. Perfect. So if I did need support then, um, how, how can I get the support? What do I do? Do I need to make an appointment? Can I just drop by? What's the process for seeking that support? 
Absolutely. So the Student Support Centre, um, which is on the ground floor of the Minerva building, which when you come and have a look, you will find that is open during office hours. And you can always walk into the Student Support Centre during the office hours. Um, from that, there are dedicated team of specialists who understand all the different things that happen in that department. And they will either be able to help you directly or they will direct you to get an appointment with the right person to help with whatever it is that's troubling you. Lovely stuff. And out of interest, if any students are having any issues, so for example, you mentioned student finance there. If any, uh, if any of our applicants are having any concerns or things they need support with before they actually reach us in September, is there anything that you can do or offer them just to help them through that process? Yeah, there really is. So we have um, a funding team and if students do have questions about student finance or anything that uh, they're trying to get ready, if they're not sure what's needed, then they can contact the Student Support Centre now. If you've got questions about your student funding or if you're worried about affording co to come to university, we have people who can maybe help you do a bit of planning before you get here. That's brilliant. And just on the subject of student finance, just with it being the 17th of May, I think it's worth just quickly highlighting uh, the 19th of May, Catherine, and what that date, uh, what that date is involved in. OK, so if you want to make sure that your student funding is in place in time to start university, you really need to be getting all of your applications in as soon as possible. Um, the deadline to getting it, getting your application in is um, yeah, to, towards the end of May. If you miss that deadline, it isn't the end of the world. So don't panic. You st still can apply, um, but you just need to make sure that you get that application in as soon as possible. And again, any questions at all about that, please do drop an, um, an email. We'll put the email in the um, chat, shall we, or on the screen. They can just email studentsupport at lincoln.ac.uk and um, that your questions will get to the right people. So yeah, just ask questions. I'm sure we can help. Lovely stuff, Catherine. And just quickly, um, just on, on the notes of other support before students arrive at university, so you've mentioned about funding. Is there anything else that we can offer advice about if students do want to get in contact? Uh, we absolutely can. So if you're worried about anything to do with coming to university that might be um, linked to personal circumstances, so it might be that you get certain welfare benefits at the moment and you might want some guidance about how coming to university might affect that. It might be that you live in your own home and you're not coming directly from um, from your parents' home and you might want some guidance about what that might mean when it comes to university. So anything that you're personally thinking might be a concern, certainly drop us a line. If it isn't us, the um, specialist in the student support office will be able to guide you to other people within the university who can help with those issues. So please don't hesitate to contact us. That's absolutely perfect. Well, thank you very much for giving us the rundown on the Student Support and Advice Centre, Catherine. Um, so now, if it's OK, I would like to hand over to Nixie, who worked in a very similar area, but actually with the Students' Union instead. So let's bring up Nixie. Hi, Nixie. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you, Luke. How are you? Oh, absolutely brilliant. Thank you good. for asking. So uh, we've just spoken to Catherine about the uh, University Student Support and Advice Centre. So uh, you actually work in the Students' Union Advice Centre, don't you? I do, yes. So whilst we're similar in some senses, we're also a big key difference between us is that we're independent from the university. So if students need to hold uh, the university accountable, if they have any issues with their courses, we always try and advise and guide students on that. So you're definitely uh, a sort of first point of call if people are having issues with their academic studies. Yes, yeah, so, so it's yeah, that's yeah, so it's academics, housing and finance. So like I said, quite similar to the university student support, but we are independent in that there are different ways that we offer advice as well. That's brilliant. So for any student that was concerned, if they needed to raise a complaint about anything to do with the university itself, there's potentially that sort of safety net. They know it's not going to sort of affect them directly from the university yeah of course yeah we offer a confidential service so um everything that is said to us from students we don't report it back to personal tutors heads of schools anything like that um it is very much what you tell us we keep it between ourselves uh, unless there is uh any serious issues that we need to raise perfect and you mentioned that you also offer support with finance and housing as well do you mind just telling us a bit about both of those and what the yeah. Union can do to support 
Of course, yeah. So within the Students' Union, we also have the accreditation scheme. And although the SU Advice Centre don't run that, we do have a part in knowing which housing is accredited. So when we say accredited, we mean housing that has been approved for student use. So this year, we've been helping students who live in those properties that perhaps have issues with them. And we would raise it to estate agents. And we're also help, able to help students with, uh, say, issues with their contracts or maintenance issues as well. So that's our main housing. With finance, we have a food bank and a state bank so due to the rise of uh, the cost of living we're able to help students with financial difficulties so if they just come in and speak to an advisor we kind of uh, take it from there as well perfect and just in the same way um as with the uh university sort of based student support center um is there sort of a physical place that students can walk into do they need to book appointments can they literally just come in and ask a question yeah, that's OK. So we're located opposite the university library. Uh, we're in the main sort of student union building. It's a big red building on campus. You can't really miss it. And we're on the ground floor. Students can walk in between 12 p.m. and 2 p.m. Monday to Friday and you don't have to pre-book an appointment for that. Outside of those hours, we do ask that you book a 30 minute appointment with an advisor to go through everything. We've also recently just started an evening drop in. So between 5 p.m. and 7 p.m. on Tuesdays for students that perhaps are not available in the daytime. You can come and speak to one of the advisors in the evening. That's lovely. And I was actually having a look on the uh, Students Union website earlier just to get some more information for myself. And I noticed that you do actually run some workshops within the advice centre as well. Do you know yeah. anything about that? Yeah, that's okay. So for this current year, we uh, we have been running workshops. So uh, we did sort of budgeting and housing workshops. They were two of our most popular ones. So for the budgeting workshop, we just went through with students how to budget, uh, sort of tips and tricks at living at university. And with housing, it was going into private housing, what to look for, what bills you may have to pay. So that's something that we've done from this past academic year. Uh, it's still being decided what we will be doing in the next one. It may be that new ideas come up. Obviously, everything's changing all the time. So we make sure to adapt to the student population. Sure, that's brilliant. Well, thank you very much for that, Nixie. Um, if it's you. all right, then we'll move on and speak Brilliant. to Lilu from our ResLive team, and we'll just get an overview of what our ResLive team do on campus for us. How are you doing, Lilu? I'm great, Luke, how are you? Brilliant, thanks for asking. Um, so, ResLive, what is it? Can, can you just tell us a bit about what it is and what you do to support our students? Uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to speak about RestLife. Uh, so RestLife is a very dynamic team that's on campus at the minute. So we basically provide students with opportunity to settle in and um, meet new people. And basically, we facilitate students to have a great experience throughout the year with our planned program of events and activities. So from the moment uh, students arrive on campus, we organize events which will help students to uh, get to know each other and then form uh, all those of important friendship so basically we are a peer-to-peer -peer service so our team is a is all fra form of uh, framed with students who are uh, trained specifically to uh, support students uh, on campus so we have something happening every week literally um, during the term so you will always have something to do on campus perfect and you, you mentioned there to help students settle in so is that like to student accommodation uh, we are uh, not uh, we are uh, we work alongside accommodations and student support, but then we are basically, when, when I mentioned settling in, uh, we help students with information that they require, especially with accommodations, with academics, with their personal life, On and generally uh, we take students on city tours, campus tours. So basically what we do is signpost students to the right service. So as we have different support services joining us today and then other services on campus, societies, we signpost students to the right service with the right information that they require at the moment from the moment they are on, they are in Lincoln. I think that's so important there. You just mentioned about signposting to other services. Obviously all of our support services on campus are so interlinked and work so closely together. So obviously, if you go to one and they're not able to offer the support, they'll make sure they get you to the place Absolutely. that you need to be. So I understand ResLife have their own space on campus. Uh, do you mind just telling us a bit about that? 
Yes, we have our Rest Life Lounge from this year onwards. It's a really warm and cozy space for students to gather. So we are situated in Signature of Building B, which is one of the accommodations. Uh, we're on the ground floor. Uh, it's accessible to everyone, all students. So we're open uh, and um, the Rest Life Lounge is open for students literally every day or all day uh, on all weeks. Uh, so we're open from 6 p.m. in the evening to uh, 10 p.m. In, uh, in the night on weekdays. And then weekends, we're open from two to six for students to visit and drop in any time. Lovely. And just with you mentioning Signet Wharf there, do you have to be a resident of Signet Wharf or is it open to more people than that? So uh, rest, um, any student can visit Rest Life Lounge. So basically we offer services for students who live in any uni accommodations. So it doesn't mean, doesn't matter which accommodation you live in. So we have Lincoln Coats and Signet Wharf close by to us. And then we have students walking literally every day for Valentine Coat as well. That's perfect. And uh, so we've spoken about the lounge and the sort of uh, in-person service you offer. I understand you also offer a uh, telephone service as well. Yes. Do you mind just telling us a bit about that? Yes. So um, there are two functions that our Breast Life student assistants do. So some of us, when we are, um, some of us will be in the lounge present for students to have events and chat with. And then some of us will be on an active line, uh, which is from 6 p.m. in the evening, which is till midnight so students can ring us call us anytime send us an email uh, or messages on instagram or facebook groups and then we'll be able to answer their queries and then uh, some some of the students will be um, referred to us and we always reach out to them as well and we always do follow up with students that's lovely well thanks very much for telling us about res life um so if it's okay uh we'll move on lastly to tom in the student well-being team so we can wait for tom to come up Hello there, Tom. How are you doing? Yes, good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, very well, thanks. Good. So, last but certainly not least, uh, Tom, you work in the Student Wellbeing Centre, don't you? Yes, that's right, yeah. Perfect. And do you mind just telling us how the Student Wellbeing Centre does support our students? Yeah, so we can help support students in a number of um, different ways. Sort of what we cover in terms of support varies massively. Um, you know, we look after people with um, disabilities, um, whether that's physical or mental health as well, any sort of impairments, so visual impairments, hearing impairments, um, learning differences, um, mental health issues, um, you know, whether that's diagnosed or undiagnosed. Um, we cover so many sort of different things through through student wellbeing, you know, and if if it's not um, us that helps, we can also, like I say earlier, signpost for the people, make sure people are getting sort of the right support and I suppose holistic support as well, support from all the right areas, you know, it's never likely that um, one service across the university will fix everything. So we work closely together to make sure um, each student is sort of supported as fully as possible um, to help with their university experience. That's brilliant. So whereabouts on campus then can we find the, uh, the Student Wellbeing Centre? So we are very close um, to the centre of campus. So we are in a building called the Marina Building, which is just near sort of the main Minerva um, building that you'll see on your campus tours as well. Um, quite handily, we are sort of sandwiched in between um, GP here on campus, the health service, um, and the Swan Pub as well. So we're kind of nice and student facing um, uh, around that area as well. So just again, I do want to double check with you. So um, is it a service that you can just walk into or do you need to book appointments in advance? So we work um, similarly to everyone else, really, sort of a mix of um, walk-ins and appointments. Um, so back in January, we changed our walk-in times. So we are now open for walk-in appointments between 10 a.m. Um, and 4 p.m. Monday to Friday. And then on Thursdays during term time, we also have um, our evening walk-ins between 5 and 7 p.m. Um, and that's where people can just walk in um, and speak to us. And then depending on um, those appointments, we can look at um, booking further appointments with our advisors um, here at Student Wellbeing for a bit of a longer conversation um, around the right support and ongoing support, things like that. So it's kind of a mix of both, um, but, you know, we're really accessible students, like I say, can walk in between 10 and 4, Monday to Friday um, and speak to someone. Brilliant. And it's it's really good there that you mentioned ongoing support. I think it's it's great to highlight the fact that it's not just, you know, you sort of come in and, and get seen once. If you do need that ongoing support, the wellbeing centre really is there to support you throughout all of your studies, aren't they? Absolutely, yeah. And that, that support looks different as well. You know, that may be one-to-one -one appointments with one of our advisors regularly. Um, you know, we have access to a counselling service here at Student Wellbeing as well. 
and if that's the appropriate support for you. Um, but we also have a lot of group work as well, so skills groups, um, a lot of projects. We've got our Manuel Mental Health, uh, Male Mental Health Support Group. Um, we have our allotment projects and Sky Garden projects, so getting out and about and doing practical skills as well as um, social and mental health stuff as well. Um, yeah, lots of different um, resources to sort of that support we offer um, can vary greatly between people. So there's lots of different options for people. That's brilliant. And just um, just in, in the run up to people starting their studies in September, um, are they able to contact you if they do need any support or if they have any uh, concerns or any uh, sort of additional needs in September? Are they able to contact you prior to joining? Absolutely are, yes. Um, yeah, get in touch via email or by phone. Um, if students have um, declared something on UCAS as well, that comes straight through to us and we normally outreach to them in the first instance um, to talk about the support that is available, uh, to discuss what support and options are there for them as well. Um, but if you haven't declared that on UCAS, that is not a problem at all. Um, get in touch via email or by phone and we can discuss that support with you. Any questions you might have, whether that's about our support, whether it's about starting uni in general, you know, we appreciate it. it's a big, scary change for everyone sort of moving away to university and we're here sort of to help make that transition into university as easy as possible. So any questions about anything, get in touch. Um, hopefully we can answer those questions. And if not, we can certainly pass people over to, to the right people to answer those questions. That's brilliant. One last thing I did want to ask just before we bring everyone back in and, and go through some questions more generally. Um, if anybody whilst they're studying does have a concern maybe about a friend or a classmate or anything, uh, can they contact you for advice about that as well? Or does it have to be just your own personal well-being that you contact? No, absolutely get in touch. Any concerns you have, um, let us know. Obviously, we want to make sure um, the people that contact us first are feeling supported as well, because they may well be affected by whatever's going on with their friend or course mate. Uh, but we can absolutely take on those concerns and reach out and make sure um, the other person involved get any support they need as well um so yeah if you have any queries or questions about anyone um get in touch and we can help pick it up and make sure the right support is in place for those who need it that's perfect well thanks very much tom uh, i think it's about time then that we brought everyone back in and uh let's ask some questions to the whole group so we'll bring back Catherine, lilu and nixie as well so to start off uh there is one topic that i know is hot on everyone's mind at the minute and I'd just like to spend some time, I know we already have discussed it a little bit, but just talking about the cost of living crisis and just what support is available between the various services in the university and if there's anything that, that we can sort of make students aware of now. So I don't know if anyone has anything they instantly want to jump in with. You can see Catherine nodding. Go, go for it, Catherine. Yes, okay. So yes, it is a worry. It's a worry for everybody. Um, as a student, once you've enrolled at the University of Lincoln, the university has a financial assistance fund. So if you do find yourself struggling financially, then there are funds available that you might be able to apply for. And when you arrive, you can get lots of information all about that. Um, and we also have um, advice about how to manage money as well in the same way as Student Union do the workshops. We have some advisors as well if you've got personal concerns about those sorts of things too. Perfect. Does anyone else have anything they, they'd like to add? Any other support that we can offer just to put people's minds at ease? Uh, obviously, as I mentioned earlier, the SU Advice Centre, we have a food bank um, and a stationary bank. So that is sort of a more practical items. We don't uh, sort of have any money, such as student support and advice, but we do allow students to access the food bank and the stationary bank if they can't afford um, sort of their basic needs. The other thing as well that is something that we link in with student wellbeing and student support with is we have a care package voucher. So that allows students who are going through financial difficulty to three days of food and toiletries. And again, that is um, that also comes with sort of having an advisor there to talk with you about other options as well. Lovely. And uh, Tom, I, I, I know obviously uh, the Student Wellbeing Centre, are, are, they're obviously involved in this because there's a lot of general anxiety and stress about people's finances right now. Have you got anything specifically in place to sort of deal with, with the cost of living concerns? Absolutely. We appreciate it. it's uh, a big challenge for everyone at the minute that's going on with um, cost of living. Yeah, we're here to help um, support people on the sort of emotional and mental impact that has. You know, we appreciate um, 
money worries are sort of always at the top of the list of students' worries anyway, um, let alone when things are getting more and more expensive. So um, whilst we don't have any sort of practical funds, I suppose, or things like that we offer, you know, we're here to help deal with dealing with the emotional impact and, and mental strain that has on students as well. Um, and obviously, you know, we can link across to um, Catherine and the student support team, the SU advice team as well, where appropriate, you know, they've got great links with um, all of the teams to help, help make sure they are supported and their needs are met. Um, so yeah, any worries, any impact it's having on people, that's where we sort of step in and, and help support them. Lovely, thank you. Now, I'd just like to just take a moment to remind people, um, anyone that is watching, if you do have any questions, please pop them in that comment section. We've got these lovely staff members here who want to help you and make sure you have absolutely everything answered. So feel free to, to pop any concerns you have in that comment section. We have actually had one. I feel like this um, this might be for you, Catherine. Uh, so we have been asked, when can uh, you apply for a scholarship or a bursary? Oh, OK. That's a really good question. And I'm going to be very vague. OK, um, it depends on the scholarship and the bursary. So my advice would be go and have a look at the university website, find the scholarships and bursaries that you're interested in applying for. Each one of them will have information in the uh, on the pages that explains what you need to do. Some of them you don't need to do anything. Some of them you have to fill in an application form. So go and have a look. And if you have any questions, each one of those bursaries or scholarships has a contact detail attached to it. Um, but again, if you're not sure, if you email the student support team, they can probably direct you to the right team. So yeah, go and have a look and um, yeah, check out each one. Thanks for that, Catherine. I think it is worth highlighting. Uh, we do offer a range of scholarships and bursaries to support our students. And I think that's especially important now, obviously with us mentioning the cost of living crisis. So definitely, if you haven't already, just take a look at what is on offer. Just see if anything applies to you because it, it's, it's support that's there if you're eligible. So you, you lose nothing by having a look. Perfect. So. One thing that, that I know a lot of people are concerned about when they reach out for support then is confidentiality. And if they reach out for support, who's going to be told and, and you know, how's it going to get escalated? So I, I do just want to spend a minute, if it's OK, talking with you about confidentiality, who we need to tell about things and who we won't necessarily contact. Now, I know it's, it's a broad range of issues, but if you can just... If, if someone can give me an idea of the sort of confidentiality uh, guidelines within the university and also um, with regards to sort of nominated support as well. So I am aware that as a university, we do give people the option to nominate someone to be contacted if needed. So if, if someone wouldn't mind just sort of running us through that, that would be absolutely brilliant. Fantastic. I'll take that one if you guys don't mind. Um, so. I suppose it varies very slightly between the different services as to, um, first of all, I suppose what information is taken um, and then what is shared. So with Institute of Wellbeing, um, you know, all the our appointments, we have a system where we write our notes on and that can only be seen by people within our service. Um, uh, if there are situations that arise um, through our service, through walk-ins, through appointments, wherever it may be, where we need to escalate it further, um, then we do potentially contact um, local partners, um, local um, organisations to make sure the students are supported. Um, we have sort of information sharing agreements in place. So again, confidentiality is kept pretty well. Um, you know, we've got these agreements in place, but there are some occasions where we need to um, involve other parties um, and inform them of that as well. Um, in terms of nominated person, um, again, this I suppose would be part of the process, but if there were ever serious concerns or we can't get hold of um, students when there are serious concerns, that is when we would contact um, a nominated person to try and get um, some maybe more information, um, things like that, but they are used to be they're to be used in um, pretty sort of emergency situations. We can't just go around telling them everything you've come to see us about, things like that. That's all kept in house unless there is a genuine um, reason that we need to escalate that and share that information um, wider. So anything that is said to us, you know, is kept pretty pretty under wraps, pretty confidential, um, unless there is a genuine need to escalate it further, um, whether that's nominated person or local services, whatever that may be. That's lovely. Thank you, Tom. So it, it very much is a, an extreme scenario, need to know basis kind of thing. But on top, like other than that, 
obviously everybody's uh, information is safe unless it has to be escalated. Perfect. So I, I've been dying to ask, Lulu, obviously we spoke about the Res Life Lounge earlier. Now, I actually had a look in there for the first time um, a few days ago, and it, it's a really cool facility. Um, it's got all kinds of things in there. Do you want to just tell us a bit about that and the sort of social events that you do have going on in there? All right. Um, so, uh, as I said, we have um, events happening literally every day. So from Monday to Friday, the Rest Life Lounge is open for students. Uh, some days uh, um, we have events happening in the, at the Rest Life Lounge. So we have got a pool table, table tennis, uh, snooker, dart boards, and all sorts of board games. And we have everything recharged on our TV, Netflix, Amazon Prime, everything. So you can watch movies with your friends. Everything that we provide, all the events are free for students. So it's just that we ask uh, students to book our events and check out our events on Eventbrite and check out our Instagram. If you follow us on our Instagram and follow us on our Eventbrite, you'll know what events is happening on each day. And students can walk in uh, from 6 p.m. and stay till 10. Sometimes we have bigger events, like like karaoke evening or bingo night which is one of the most popular events so we have it at a different venue which we announced prior so we have uh, also besides these we have cultural events and uh, especially we had Diwali uh, Lunar New Year and uh, we had we did celebrate coronation it was it was we had an afternoon tea party so we run all sorts of events especially uh, in, including all kinds of students from different parts of the world as well we try to um, include everyone uh, we have uh, we celebrate black history month pride month and um, uh, everything basically uh, that just to feel students to feel like home away from home kind of an environment so anybody who walks into rest life lounge uh, we have our rsas and you pick your game you can do multiple activities at the same time in the lounge so it's a really nice warm cozy space <laughs> I think it's brilliant that you mentioned uh, you run sort of multi-faith events uh, within the Res Life Lounge. Now, it is worth noting that uh, this evening we have got just a handful of what is actually available at the university. I think now is a really good time to mention that uh, if anybody does want any faith-related support, we do actually have a really great service on campus. We have our multi-faith chaplaincy who are there for any sort of faith support concerns. They have their, their own chaplaincy on their campus. And, and they can be contacted if, if you do want to get involved in any of the amazing things they do. Um, so, so it's just worth bearing that in mind. Now, I did have a, another couple of questions uh, for the group. Uh, so what I did want to ask is uh, often, you know, we, we do get students who make us aware of additional needs they have when it comes to their studies. Uh, so things like mitigating circumstances, for example, if, if something happens, uh, you know that, that causes a bit of a shock to the system for students is there any support we can offer can we help students through any sort of sudden unexpected uh occurrences that happen to them basically i don't know who wants to take this i can do a little bit about mitigating circumstances if that's okay Lovely. that would be brilliant thanks nixie <laughs> that's okay so um at the su advice center we understand the process and the procedures that go through mitigating circumstances we're also aware that anything can happen at any time so we're always ready to help students with um, sort of completing the form, gathering evidence and submitting it, and then also going through sort of those next steps, whether that's a resit or whether that is uh, interrupting from their studies, we will go through the process with the student until they get an outcome that they're happy with, or we will carry on until we get an outcome that they want. Um, whether that takes months, weeks, doesn't matter, we'll go through it with them. We also will help students with extensions as well. So it kind of feeds in with the mitigating circumstances before you get to the, the more serious end of things. Uh, we always see what the sort of the first steps are as well. So, yeah, that's a little bit about what we do. But I, I think Catherine was going to say something as well. So. Yes, Nixie, I was going to support everything that you've just said. Um, and I'm just going to say you never know what's going to happen with all the best planning in the world. You never know. And the most important thing is that as soon as you recognize that you've got any kind of problem or barrier that you approach one of the services that are here today because if we're not the right one we will get you to the right one straight away that's lovely and just on that so obviously um we're sort of hinted at one-off shocks that might happen while someone's studying and supporting them equally if there's something longer term uh, that, that means a student requires a bit of extra support with their studies 
is there anything that we can offer um, the, these students and put in place for them to support them through their studies? I'll jump in here. Um, so if um, students come to university and they have a diagnosed condition, whether that's physical health, uh, mental health impairments, disabilities, whatever that may be, as long as it's diagnosed, we can look at putting um, in place something called a PASS plan. So PASS just stands for Personalised Academic Study Support. Um, and it's a, a plan that helps your support their learning, essentially, um, to make reasonable adjustments within their school to help sort of make their studies as accessible as possible to them um, and sort of bring them up to, I suppose, a level playing field with um, their peers that don't have um, diagnoses or conditions and things like that. Um, so we do that through student wellbeing. Like I say, we need to see some sort of evidence of a diagnosis, um, whether that's things like doctor's letters, um, there's lots of different things we can accept. Um, we have a list and a guide on our website as to um, what we can accept and what can also be accepted for DSA as well, Disabled Students Allowance. Um, so that's another method of support um, that is sort of organised and run through Student Finance England. And that support sort of works hand in hand with um, our past plans at um, the Student Wellbeing Centre. Um, now, despite going through Student Finance England, it's not normally money that's given to students. It's things like goods and services. So things like assistive technology, software, one-to-one um, -one support, whether that's specialist mentors or study skills. Um, there's a wide range of support available from um, DSA. Um, and there's an you know, application form you can look at. I believe applications are open for um, September 23. Um, so have a look on the um, government website. If you just Google DSA, it should pop up. Um, but there's lots of support available. Um, like I say, past plans need some sort of evidence of a diagnosis, um, but we are also able to help students um, without a diagnosis as well. It's just that for past plans, um, we do need that, that evidence. Um, but otherwise, just get in touch. There's lots of support um, available through ourselves um, for any sort of well-being um, disability, mental health concerns, things like that. So with you mentioning there that a student would need a diagnosis for a past plan, I know that some students are a bit concerned because they, you know, it's clear to them that they might need extra support, might have a, a condition that requires these, these past plans, but they don't actually have a diagnosis yet. Is getting a diagnosis something the Student Wellbeing Centre can support with? Um, it would depend on what the diagnosis is for. So we are not a clinical service, so we can't diagnose anything sort of medically. Um, they would all have to go through doctors, GPs, things like that to get diagnosis for, for anything really. What we may be able to help with is doing a screener test for learning differences. Um, and then if um, possible, depending on funds and things like that, we can then potentially um, refer onwards for assessments for Things like learning differences, um, so dyslexia, for example, dyscalculia, um, dyspraxia, um, ADHD as well. I know that's um, a big topic of conversation at the minute. Um, you know, there is potentially we can screen for um, ADHD and then refer onwards um, regarding that. And then obviously we can pick up the support um, after any sort of assessment that students go through. That's lovely. Now, Obviously, we've mentioned that, that a lot of the people watching uh, will be joining us in September, but might have questions they want answering, might have support they need between now and then. I was just wondering if uh, if there's anything sort of going on, maybe any workshops, any events at the university uh, to help people around support if there is that extra need or if there's anything extra they sort of need to do before they start. Does anyone uh, does anyone have any advice on things that people can do before they start? Yeah, I can. I mean, I have to say one of the most important things is that planning, really. And most of the things that students are worried about is about their money. So my, I suppose, top tips really is get your application to student finance as in as soon as you possibly can. If you're at all unsure about any of the questions, contact the student support um, at lincoln.ac.uk so that we can help you get that application done um, quickly and um, properly. And again, if you're worried about budgeting, managing money, if you've got welfare benefits or you might be a carer or anything like that that might impact on your um, studies, then we can help you get that preparation and make sure that you're ready to come um, so that that happens as smoothly as possible. 
on that subject as well about managing money, um, it's worth noting that uh, Catherine actually uh, was involved in a live lounge a few weeks ago that's on our YouTube channel still, uh, if you did want to watch it, on just that, on managing your money at university. So if you do have any concerns re uh, relating to that as well, it's definitely worth checking that out because, uh, well, as, as Catherine will tell you, it was a, a really great session with a lot of really good advice. That's perfect. Well, if anybody does uh, still have any questions, please pop them in the comments. But for now, what we're going to do is we're going to hand over to Jazz uh, from our schools and colleges liaison team. And she is going to run us through everything you need to consider before you join us in September. Hi, Jazz. How are you doing? Hi, I'm good. How are you? Yeah, good. Thank you. So you're going to run us through everything that, that needs to be thought about between now and September, aren't you? So I'm going to stop talking for a moment and I'm going to give you the floor here. Sure. Um, so I'm just going to see if I can get the um, slides up. Perfect. There we go. Um, so yeah, hi everyone. As I said right at the start, my name is Jasmine. Um, I'm a student recruitment officer that works as part of the education liaison team at Lincoln. Um, so it's basically our job to provide support, advice, guidance, everything else leading up to students um, before university. Um, I was actually a student at Lincoln myself as well, it's worth mentioning. Um, and everything you just heard from all the different support staff um, is super accurate. I did access different support services whilst I was with um, the university and they were absolutely brilliant. Um, and, you know, I got to use all the different avenues and, and everything they're saying um, is completely accurate. So if you do need any of that support, please do access it either now or when you come in September. But um, on to the main topic, we're going to go through what is essentially going to come next in terms of your university journey, what things you need to do, what's actually going to happen, um, and just a few kind of little tips and things of what you might want to do in preparation for joining us. So as we've mentioned before, we are almost at the student finance deadline now. So if you haven't already, now would be the time to apply um, as the deadline is Friday. You have still got a bit of time. Um, and as Catherine mentioned earlier, even if you don't do it now, you can still put an application in. Um, but the sooner you do it, the more likely you're going to get your funding when you need it. Once that's out of the way, um, you're kind of done with your applications and things um, besides accommodation if you need that. Um, and then you're actually going to have to make a decision. So hopefully you should have all your choices by now. Um, and again, if you haven't already, you can kind of have a look and see which one is essentially going to be your favourite. Um, and then another one that's kind of slightly below that. I will explain um, those a little bit further later on. But that decision will come kind of in the next few weeks um, or month or so. Then once you've done that, you don't really have to do much after that um, besides your own personal things to prepare for university. So that might be getting in touch with the support staff, um, you know, looking into budgeting, things like that, um, just to help yourself before you get to us. Then, of course, results day is going to come and um, hopefully it won't be too scary for you all. And you're either going to get into a place or you might start looking at clearing um, if you don't get into any of the universities that you looked at or you decide to change your mind or anything like that. Once that's all sorted, you've then made it. Hopefully, um, hopefully you're with us um, and you can start to enjoy Freshers Week. So that's kind of um, the last few steps that are going to come. Normally, when we show this timeline, it's a lot longer. So we are right at the end of this now, um, which hopefully makes you all quite happy and looking forward to the start of your university journey. So the first thing to look at, because of course, as I mentioned, you will soon have to decide which choice is going to be your firm offer and which choice is going to be insurance offer. It might be useful to understand actually what the different offers you have are. So you can basically get three different responses on UCAS. Um, the first one being a conditional offer. So this basically just requires you to meet certain entry requirements to secure your place at university on results day. So you'll do your exams or you might be finishing assignments at the minute and things like that. And that will secure your place if you get the correct entry requirements, which unfortunately you have to wait till results day for, but you will find out and it will automatically tell you. You might instead, though, have an unconditional offer. Now, these are great because it basically means you've already secured your place. No matter you know, the outcome of your exams and assignments, you're already going to that university if you want it. Now, you do have to put this as your firm choice to accept it, but there's no conditions to you joining the university of your choice. Or, you know, alternatively, you might have been rejected. Unfortunately, that means you haven't been offered a place, but there's lots of different things you can do about that in terms of looking at clearing and UCAS Extra for different um, offers as well, which we'll come on to a little bit later on. Now, you can't actually accept or respond to your offers until you've got 
all of them. So um, you can apply it to up to five, which probably most of you have. And you have to have all of those, whether that's a rejection, an unconditional offer or a conditional offer before you can actually make that decision. Now, hopefully, all those decisions will have come through by tomorrow. So um, it was nice and soon. You should probably have most of them already. But if you haven't, there might even be one or two to come in the next 24 hours. Then once you've got those, you've got all the way until the 8th of June to decide where you want to put them, essentially, in the order of preference. So we always want to mention UCAS Extra here, because if you are in a situation where you might have had rejections or maybe you did get accepted to one, but not the one you really wanted to go to and you got rejected from that one, there's alternative ways you can go about potentially getting another offer. And UCAS Extra is exactly that. So if you're not holding any offers for whatever reason, whether you've been rejected from all of them, or that you just don't like the ones that you have been given and you change your mind, you can then reject them and basically apply to another one. So it all comes up on your UCAS Hub. If that's the case, there's a little button where you can choose to do that. Um, if you've not used all your five choices, you unfortunately do have to fill those first, but it makes it straightforward like a normal UCAS application. Otherwise, it comes up as an extra. You can find a university, apply for it, and then it takes 21 days to hear back. Now, you can do this for different courses, but you have to do it one course at a time. So it can be quite a long process um, and it might put you kind of behind a little bit in terms of the timeline, but it's still a really great option. And if that university accepts that offer, it automatically becomes your firm choice. So that's going to be where you're going to go in September, which very nicely takes me on to what a firm and an insurance choice are. So your firm choice out of the five potential offers that you have is the one you want to go to. It's like putting one at the top and then putting one as a backup, basically, when we're talking about firm and insurance choices. Do make sure it's as firm as possible, you know, your favourite, you, you like everything about it, whether that's accommodation, the course, everything else. And then your insurance choice, hopefully, you will like just as much, but it's good to put there just in case on results day, your firm choice rejects you, you'll automatically get into your insurance choice if you meet their entry requirements. So it's nice to have a bit of a backup. We'd always recommend that if you have applied for anywhere where your entry requirements are slightly lower than some of your other offers and you're kind of looking to go there potentially, put one of those as your insurance choice because then if you don't meet the entry requirements for your firm choice, which may be slightly higher, you're more than likely going to get into your insurance choice. So it is kind of like a backup in that sense. Now, if you reject your first choice, even if you do get in, you will have to re-enter through clearing. So when you put your firm choice, if you do automatically get it on results day, but you decide actually I don't want to go there and oh actually I'm not sure I want to go to my insurance choice, or even if you do want to go to your insurance choice, unfortunately if you reject it yourself, you can't go back into your insurance choice. You would have to go completely separately through clearing. So it's just good to know. But that is still an option if it comes to it and you do change your mind. So we've already kind of covered a few bits about funding support um, at the university, but it's definitely something to look at as a whole um, from now until kind of September. We've gone through student finance and that you need to apply by Friday. That's kind of the main thing really to get you prepared. But there's a really, really vast range of resources where you can get additional grants or loans. You know, we've spoken about scholarships and bursaries that might help you out. And now would be the time to do that research. So if you do need to put applications in or you do need to speak to certain people, you've got the time to do so. Um, we've kind of covered the scholarships and bursaries. There are also additional grants you can get from student finance themselves. So aside from the main application, definitely do a little bit of a Google of that. It's dependent on certain circumstances about you. You can also get um, learning support funds for healthcare courses. So that's the point you can see where it says £5,000 funding for nursing, midwifery and some other allied health courses. It's not just those two or others, I would say. There are actually some that people don't think are included in that. So definitely Google if you're looking um, or you've applied for a course that's in the healthcare sector, definitely have a look and see if that applies for you because it's a really big additional amount of money that's going to support you, especially whilst you're completing work placements and things like that. And those extra things aside from student finance are really great because they are all yours. So with student finance, you do have to pay it back after university, but your kind of scholarships and bursaries and grants and things, you don't. So it is money there for you to use if you need it. And there you've got just a little fact. We've got 12 different bursaries and scholarships to support undergraduate study at the university. So definitely worth doing a research. It will be different 
um, depending on what your circumstances are and whether you're eligible or not, but definitely worth having a look at, um, like we mentioned earlier. Then, of course, one of the main things you're probably going to do next after you've done your student finance is apply for accommodation. Again, if you've not done it already, universities will advise when this opens. Um, it's dependent on the university. You'll be able to see on our website when exactly that is. Um, I'm pretty sure that it's already open, I want to say. Someone can give me a nod. Luke's giving me a nod. Yeah. Um, and in some circumstances, you might have already have to decide what your firm and insurance choice Oh, so like with us, with university managed accommodation, you are guaranteed an accommodation space if you put us as your firm or insurance choice. So it would help if you could do that beforehand um, just so that, you know, you're going to have somewhere to live, essentially. And that will often be the case at other universities, too. There might be a deposit required or even just a holding fee. It often comes in different kind of forms, depending on the place. But it's definitely a good idea to see how much that is. Do you need any support with that and um, wherever that's going to come from? do you need that to secure your space then of course also what are your options definitely go have a look if you haven't already if you can or have a look on the websites we've got some absolutely brilliant um you know 360 tours and student life videos of students taking us through um their flats and you can really see what it would actually be like to live there so definitely look at all the options we've got quite a few so there's lots to choose from um so definitely take your time to do that and then kind of pick your favorite hopefully some options as well might be competitive and um, some accommodations are bigger than others. I would say we have quite a lot of accommodations, so this generally doesn't become an issue, um, but it might do elsewhere. It's just always good to check. Um, of course, some accommodations are only so big and they only have so many flats. So if you do really want a particular accommodation, definitely fill out your application as soon as possible. If you don't do that and you are late in applying, don't panic. Um, there will almost always be somewhere for you to live. We'll always do our best to support you. Um, and get you a room before you start in September and also even if you are undecided you might be fairly local you might be thinking about commuting or you're not 100% sure do still apply anyway um, most of the time you're not going to lose anything if you decide not to um, book the accommodation but you might as well do it just so you don't lose a room in case you do decide come September it would be better for you to be living on campus or nearby then, of course, we've kind of already covered this a little bit as well, but budgeting um, is a great skill that you'll hopefully learn whilst you're at university. But it's definitely a good idea to look at it now um, so you know what's to come in September. For a lot of students, it is the first time they're going to be managing their own money. It's quite large amounts of money um, with student finance loans and things. And so it's great to just have a little look at how that's going to look now. So you probably will have um, a finite pot of money, certain amounts, um, and you can actually look on a student finance calculator to see how much that will be. So if you put your application in now or you've done it recently, you can go on there, pop in your personal details. It's not as detailed as the actual student finance application, but it will tell you how much roughly you're going to get over the year. This can be really helpful, especially for choosing your accommodation and things or just figuring out how much you're going to have per month per week and then you can split that across what you need so hopefully rent and bills and then a food shop and then whatever else you want to do so socializing you know maybe a hobby you have or maybe even joining a society if you've looked into that already now if you don't unfortunately have enough to cover what you need which can happen we've obviously gone through all the different forms of support at the university you can access those too but there's lots of other ways to help you as a student um, so part time work or being a student ambassador, which kind of are the same thing. And um, you can get part time jobs elsewhere. Of course, you might already have a job which you might be able to kind of transfer to or do something similar. As a student ambassador, you can do that as a paid role, which is absolutely brilliant. And um, I did it for accommodation whilst I was at the university. It's great because it's super flexible. You can pick and choose um, the shifts as and when you need them. There's not kind of a massive um, time commitment there if you've got exams and things like that. And it's just a good way to make extra money whilst hopefully supporting something that you're really kind of passionate about anyway. Of course, the student discounts. So whether that's particular discounts cards, you can sometimes get those through societies or, you know, uni days, just any kind of student discount. Um, student cities, especially Lincoln, if you just ask, the majority of places will offer some kind of student discount. So it's just a really good way to save money. And you can just check that now, see if that um, happens in, in the kind of cities you're looking at. Um, so, you know, to expect it. 
Of course, you can pool resources. So if you are moving into um, uni accommodation, you might be able to share things with your housemates. It sounds very simple, but it does save a lot of money, um, especially in terms of moving into university, etc. cetera. Um, through accommodation, you'll be able to find out um, what appliances and things you have. You don't all want to then turn up with the same appliance. <laughs> um, you'll be able to kind of speak to them, hopefully beforehand through um, social media and things. And then, you know, you can club together to maybe buy a toaster or something like that and then it's going to save you a little bit of money there too. We'd also say about a student bank account now is a really great time to actually start looking at this and potentially set one up and um, it would keep your money completely separate from maybe any bank accounts that you already have and um, just really really good kind of incentives attached to it as well so you might have an interest-free overdraft or you might get given something for free or more discounts and then of course as well don't forget the scholarships and bursaries and then bank of relatives which is basically anyone that is there to support you whilst you're at university too so as you can see there's loads of different things you can do to kind of find out how much money you're going to have how you're going to budget and maybe even practice it now if you've never done a food shop for example you could do one now and see how much it comes to see what you'll be able to afford so kind of lastly, um, results day, we just want to cover what might happen to you, essentially. That sounds very dramatic, but in terms of um, your kind of offers and your choices, there's a few different scenarios you might be in. And it's just nice to know what would happen in that circumstance and how you can be prepared. So the first option would be that you would meet the entry requirements of your firm choice. They accept you and that's it that's done, you know where you're going, you can then start kind of preparing in other ways. The second option is that you don't mean your foot meet your firm requirements and it drops into your insurance. So that's why we always say to for you to hopefully like your insurance choice just as much as your first and then you're still going to be happy about where you're ending up. If you reject that one, of course, you just drop into clearing and you can look elsewhere. The third option, you exceed your entry requirements and you might actually like to consider another university. Now, you would have to reject yourself from your current kind of offers, but then you'd be able to look elsewhere through clearing, maybe at places that you didn't look at before because you got better grades than you thought. Or option four, you didn't previously apply you know, at all. You might not have applied for UCAS at all, but you've actually surprised yourself and you might think, maybe I do want to go to university, in which case you can apply through clearing from scratch as well. Really important to remember as well that clearing doesn't close on results day. Um, once it all comes through, say you've been rejected and you're going through clearing or for whatever reason you're looking at clearing, on UCAS it'll give you suggestions of where you can apply for and universities will contact you as well. If you match up to their requirements, um, they will kind of get in touch and that can happen over a few days, a few weeks. You don't have to make a decision on that day. Clearing does stay open for a while. But whatever is going to happen, the best thing you can do is have a plan. So have a plan for what you hope is going to happen and then a plan for hopefully a backup as well. So looking at clearing and things like that. So this is literally just a tick box of pretty much everything I've said. What happens next? You're hopefully going to accept a place on UCAS, put one as your firm as insurance. You're going to apply for student finance, apply for accommodation. You're hopefully going to try some budgeting or at least look at the student finance calculator so you can figure out how much money you're going to have. You're going to maybe look at social media groups for your accommodation or your course. You can find some other people who are also going to that university. Reading lists will come at some point, so that'll be the books and things you need to look at for your course. You're then hopefully going to look at packing essentials when so it gets close to moving in. What do you need to take with you? You might want to know what's going on with Freshers Week. And then, of course, to find out all of this and support you even further, don't be afraid to visit the university again before you start. So we have summer open days that, of course, are intended for people maybe in their first year of school or college. But you are more than welcome to come and have a look again to help you decide or access the support that you need. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for that, Jazz. That was really, really helpful. Hopefully that's cleared up some concerns that people might have had about what to do between now and when they join us in September. Um, so what we'll do quickly is we'll bring everyone back, hopefully. Perfect. Look at that. So I'm very aware that time is running on now. Um, there was one comment uh, that I do quickly want to answer. I think this one's for you, Lilu. Uh, Thomas has asked, uh, do you have to pay to go to ResLife events? Uh, ResLife, all the ResLife events are absolutely free. Uh, so students don't have to pay. Students can visit uh, anytime. They just need to book sometimes. Otherwise, sometimes even you can just drop in. 
That's lovely. Well, I want to say a massive, massive thank you to everyone that's joined us today. Uh, you've all been brilliant and hopefully uh, ease some of the concerns that, that maybe some people had at the start of this stream. Um, I think the main takeaway is if you do have any questions, anything you want to make us aware of, then, then please do just get in touch. Even if you don't know where to go initially, we'll direct it to the right place. But yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you to everyone uh, in the comments that asked questions. And please do just reach out if you need any further support.